Okay, so to start on uh, uh, where we left off, so towards the very end, I was talking about this concept of energy proportionality and kind of the basic uh, notion being that we design systems, even though this example is for computers, but this thing applies uh, for all sort of systems really, uh, that uh, we design them with a certain performance rate uh, or capacity in mind. Uh, but we do not use them that way. So, if you look at typical usage, uh, on rare occasions they would be uh, operating at the peak capacity, but most of the time they are somewhere in the middle or in often uh, they are simply lying idle. And that observation, um, this particular paper which is cited in the bottom left, Google made when they kind of were in the early days of uh, cluster computing data centers and all. And uh, the implications of this are that. Um, the way we design our systems, uh, just naturally the way the technology is, there is always a baseline cost, energy cost of keeping systems up and running, okay. So, your car idling or your computer just being on or uh, so on and so forth. So, what the net effect of that is that if you look at um, uh, kind of this utilization um, versus or whatever, uh, the server power versus utilization curve it kind of looks like that green plot out there. So, even though I am using it, um, e even though I am basically doing nothing, there is that uh, y intercept which is the uh, baseline power that you are paying for. So, this is if, if it is a electrical system then this would be leakage in circuits and things like that. If it is a vehicle then it is uh, whatever this the engine idling, if it is a building it is just your HVAC system running and lights being there and all. Uh, so, th th there is this inevitable baseline power consumption that happens and that when you view it as an energy efficiency that is energy uh, power as a function of uh, what you are getting out of the system then we essentially end up having that red plot which basically means that we achieve peak efficiencies uh, at the high end, but we are rarely there and most of the time we are operating at the lower end of the regime and that is where essentially efficiency is close to 0. So, most uh, if you specifically because this work came out in context of data center servers, uh, if you look at uh, servers and all and if you look at their utilization versus power plot, indeed it looks along these lines and while this slide is old, this continues to remain true. It is very hard to design circuits with basically when you do nothing, consume nothing because you basically the only way to make sure of that is that you shut them, uh, power them off uh, entirely. Uh, uh, but, uh, but as you asymptotically approach to doing very little, then that you are still paying that baseline power. So, those of you who are with uh, circuits background, this is like I said the leakage current and all through your transistors and all, but there are analogous things in almost any, uh, any, 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 any system. So, one thing which basically it boils down, uh, points out is that uh, key to achieving uh, energy proportionality is to design your system so that uh, even when it is doing nothing or doing very little, it is doing that also very efficiently as opposed to uh, uh, just optimizing it for, uh, for, for, for the high end. So, you want your system to look something uh, like what is shown in this slide, which is uh, if I were to look at utilization, power versus utilization, I want a green line curve, it should basically kind of intercept at 0 or efficiency should basically remain flat uh, and then of course, close to 0 it is defined, so it will begin to plummet there, but uh, we want essentially a flat efficiency. Now, uh, as I said this is very hard to achieve uh, uh, at, at, at a single component level, almost any component that you pick up is not like that. If you pick up hard drive, you pick up CPU, if you, uh, in, any of these components, they, they basically have this significant y intercept. So, the way to uh, achieve this thing really is by making, uh, uh, by, by doing things so that you can create an energy proportional system out of components which are not necessarily energy proportional. So, for example, in our data center what it might mean is that I aggressively shut down unused servers, okay. So, you can think of the data center as made up of uh, this is made up of a whole bunch of uh, server blades and I shut some of them down so that when, uh, so that I only have as many blades up and running uh, as I need for the current workload and then I activate or deactivate servers on demand and this in turn uh, 
but to, to make this magic happen, you'll have to have the appropriate software support. So for example, bringing up a server always needs a certain amount of time and perhaps even some excessive energy and all. So you would need to have some ways of saying what my workload is going to be, just arrange the right amount of, uh, right count of servers being up and running at any given point in time. Uh, so by uh, managing things at the system level, you can give the illusion of uh, uh, of an energy proportional system. There are counterparts in other settings also. So let's say cars to pick an example. So a lot of recent cars have this ability that uh, they uh, automatically begin to scale down the capacity of the engine. So the, your engine is in terms of certain number of cylinders. So a six cylinder or eight cylinder engine while you, are, while you need the peak torque and all might operate at that level. But once it begins to cruise, for example, it might switch to a four cylinder engine and once yeah, you are stopped, it even can go down to zero. Yeah. Uh, in, in that data center application you mentioned, is there uh, some chance for the cooling or that the uh, amount of energy used in cooling the data center also to change? Uh, indeed, right? I mean, so as uh, so, so the cooling is usually in a very close coupling with the servers that are running, and uh, so uh, so you change the cooling load also because if you were to not do that, then the cooling will become the non-proportional part of it, and not just that, it also becomes very important um, that which servers you are running, okay? Because you want to have a good thermal thermal distribution thermal load distributed across the volume. So it's uh, it's done in a pretty intricate fashion, this close, close coupling there. So good point. Um, uh, it has to be taken into account because, uh, and, and likewise, uh, uh, in a desktop setting and all, it might be your fan load and things like that. Uh, okay, uh, so, so those kind of things. So uh, so this, this the trick therefore boils down to is that uh, energy proportionality is really a system concept as opposed to a component level concept because components almost never are going to be uh, um, energy proportional in nature. And that in turn, uh, a little bit of a, a dive into some of the hardware uh, issues that sort of relate with this picture, so at least in context of computing. Um, so. Uh, one sort of glib answer often in early days of this field used to be, oh, IC technology is improving, it will kind of solve, solve the problem. And so if you go back uh, um, into kind of 90s when this whole uh, portable computing and all began to emerge, and so those early days, a lot of initial reaction used to be, yep, it's a circuit designer's problem and we'll just write the curve. And pretty soon it became evident that that's not going to be it. I already talked a little bit about it last time, which is that uh, freak, at some stage frequencies stopped increasing and all just because the limitations of the technology come in the way and then we architectural techniques kind of begin to come into way. So, but more, more generally then uh, as technologies shrank and this, this slide is old in the sense that we stop at 32 nanometer, whereas now we are at, I guess the latest chips are in 10 nanometer uh, kind of regime. So we have gone through another three or four generations uh, related to the slide. Uh, but the main point is that uh, the, as, as the technology shrank, the in, uh, the uh, changes in speed and power were pretty complicated uh, because not everything scales uh, evenly and as you scale, as I was pointing out, the bottleneck becomes that the heat being generated per unit area begins to spike and that begins to limit things and that gave rise to in recent uh, years these terms like dark silicon and all which is basically saying that look, even if I can design something on a, on a chip, that doesn't mean I can keep it up and running because it just dissipates way too much, uh, way, 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 way too much heat. Uh, there. So, uh, so, so the bottom line out here uh, is, a, is that IC technology alone doesn't work and that apart, uh, when you are in the very low utilization regime, you still have to keep power, keep things power up your uh, sort of, uh, just, just power supply needs to be there, things need to be charged up, uh, some uh, leakage happening. The other thing which also happened is that in the early days of this discipline, again, I'm talking about 90s and early 2000s, 
a uh, lot of uh, when, when, when this change in mindset happened, so a lot of one-time tricks came into being in the sense that people used to design for faster computers and then they began to design for lower power computers and in fact the industry kind of bifurcated and you had mobile processors versus kind of uh, server desktop mm -hmm. processors. Um, but a lot of those tricks were one-time tricks and they kind of were behind. So uh, it's not like you can keep sort of flying, uh, uh, using that for a continual reduction in energy. So all of that happens. So th um, um, here I'm referring to things like power, uh, the voltage levels reduced uh, uh, so that uh, we became lower power. Uh, th th this kind of things which happen at the circuit level, again, these are things which are different. Uh, the other thing is that even if you do all of that, your typical system has a whole bunch of other components which do not necessarily benefit from the integrated circuit side of the story. So you have things like displays and hard drives and um, uh, sort of uh, magnetics <coughs> in these systems, things like that. A lot of other stuff which follows its own power performance kind of curve, so don't necessarily follow uh, the same kind of thing. Cooling systems, there are actuators, there are sensors, they all kind of uh, complicate, complicate the story. So that brings to uh, uh, the point which I made a uh, moment ago, which is uh, uh, one strategy could be that we attempt to make individual pieces of hardware, individual subsystems energy proportional and therefore if we make everything energy proportional right down to the component level, then their assemblage is, is easy to make to be energy proportional, but that's a very hard uh, thing to do uh, and essentially impossible. Uh, so real, realistically, it's the second strategy that works out that we really seek to make the entire system behave in an energy proportional manner and the typical trick is a statistical multiplexing, that is I have a whole bunch of things and I activate, deactivate a certain amount of resources in a smart manner. So uh, that strategy obviously works well in con things like data centers and all. Um, so in, uh, I'm going to skip some of these slides. Um, so in case of data centers, uh, a lot of the early work happened along, partly along this kind of a management line, which is how can I manage the resources in the data center so that we achieve this energy proportionality, which uh, largely, as I said, again, boils down to bringing servers up and down. And that in turn had implications on, you may have to move computation around. So as uh, workload begins to go down, I have to consolidate uh, the tasks that are running and so that uh, this is where things like virtualization and all began to help because you could move virtual machines across from one server to another. So some of those software things which uh, uh, you, you would have encountered otherwise played a significant role uh, in the setting. And the other part is this very careful orchestration of the cooling side of the story, the power supply and the HVACs and all together with computing. So data center really is a yeah, sort of a very careful uh, orchestration of these three things, the power supply, the cooling, and the computing, okay? And they all need to be sort of co-optimized uh, together. Um, so, uh, uh, so a lot, lot, lot of these kind of things. Let's see, am I missing any major points out there? Um, yeah, this is some more on the data center footprint, um, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, another aspect which comes up in computing to kind of uh, uh, continue on sort of this introductory story is that uh, it's one thing to, uh, when, when we think about energy efficiency and all of a computing system or any other system, uh, there are many different facets of it. So, in some senses, what I've been talking about in recent slides was really the story while the system is up and running. But that's only part of the thing. If you think about from what would what one would call as a life cycle perspective, uh, that is, you look at from production to operation to whatever uh, disposal at the end, uh, then you really ought to look at the overall uh, energy footprint of a system like that, because energy is consumed at each one of these stages in the production. Uh, so I could have two computing systems uh, if computing system is very energy efficient, but makes use of some funky material or whatever, which is very energy intensive to produce, then overall you are worse off. 
then there is the operation phase, and then finally there is the disposal part. If uh, maybe I can make a very energy efficient computer, but maybe it uses some really uh, nasty chemical in the battery and whose disposal requires a lot of expenditure of a lot of energy. So this kind of life cycle analysis one needs to do also uh, as well. So uh, in early days, yeah, go ahead. Within industry currently, how much um, emphasis do they put on end of life cycle analysis? Do they still do that? Fair bit now. Okay, so that's, uh, so this is not something it used to be like that. So if you look at the early, I would say maybe until 2010 or so thereabouts, the focus was basically on runtime. Okay, uh, and uh, but um, then uh, I think there's an organization, it might be Greenpeace if I'm not wrong, but there's some worldwide organization which they got into this thing of rating companies. Okay, and in fact, Apple used to be rated one of the worst, okay, because some of the processes they were using and all from a life cycle perspective were quite awful. But then in recent years, I guess partly because of that public pressure and all, they improved, and now in recent years, they have been at the top of the list they improved the overall pipeline. Hewlett Packard was one of the early adopters. Okay, so what these guys do is, um, I recall there's a kind of fancy tool and all which I played with uh, a few years ago, where you kind of take a product and you describe what all it is made up of, you know, and then it would give you kind of an estimate of its production energy cost also, and likewise the disposal side. So there were attempts at kind of uh, making visible, if you may, the energy aspects across the whole, across the whole thing. So there is this life cycle aspect, and in fact, um, one of the faculty uh, here at UCLA in the Institute of Environment and IEOR, this is a building which is on the other side of parking lot nine, uh, next to bomb shelter uh, there. Uh, it's, it's, it's full of people who work on environmental issues and all, and one of the behavioral economists there, uh, sorry, not industrial economists there, um, his uh, deeper project volume, his whole uh, area is this kind of life cycle analysis because focusing on a narrow slice of the life cycle can often lead to very misleading. Yeah. Um, so also on that note, you mentioned that that was public pressure. Is there any government incentives in this kind of change? Oh, in terms of just the yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I've not thought about it. Um, I guess very tangentially in the sense that there have been some funding programs and all which were created by National Science Foundation and all explicitly focusing on these kind of things. Uh, so that included things like, um, for example, on the end of the life cycle kind of thing, uh, some of the pressure towards modular <laughs> systems and all so that the whole system is not discarded but you can upgrade bits and pieces of it those kind of ideas emerged and also there were uh, funding programs and all created, but explicitly by our tax policy or something like that, I don't know, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and in this context, I mean, if you look at a broader story, oftentimes measures, like uh, one thing I recall was like, I mean, uh, people would go and buy a fancy new, very energy efficient refrigerator, but then the older refrigerator, instead of discarding it, becomes the second refrigerator still running in the garage. So you actually are worse off overall. Uh, okay, so these, so, so a lot of these things really have to do with human behavior as well. So, um, so there's just a single product's life cycle, but then all these other aspects. And then there's a shifting of energy usage that may happen. So for example, I may buy a very efficient something, but then if I begin to offload or shift the work elsewhere, or begin to consume more energy in some other dimension, then I am again worse off. So maybe, for example, um, I can um, buy a very energy efficient, uh, um, reduce the electricity footprint of my household, but then if it is coming at the cost of more natural gas consumption, then all I have to do is shift. So, so this whole thing is a complicated story. There's a life cycle element, and there is this fact that energy is consumed across different pathways, and they're often coupled. Uh, so actually my uh, postdoc Bharat, uh, who those of you were into work with, you might recall from his lecture, uh, his expertise actually is in building and energy sustainability and all. So I kind of conned him into giving a whole lecture on these life cycle issues and all. So the date, January 25th, that I'm going to be away, he's going to give a lecture on, 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 on this topic. So, uh, so it's, I mean, I think, I think 
it is not traditional electrical engineering or computer science, but there is a lot of analytics and all which is engaged, and there are there's a fair bit of architectural possibilities that kind of it opens up. An interesting topic, perhaps even uh, something worth looking from a project uh, perspective. But uh, uh, back to not sure, your question, uh, there are other things like also there are entities uh, which attempt to rate uh, recyclability of products and all. Again, not coming from government, but certainly some awareness is there. So, uh, what this slide is showing is that if you look at uh, some, uh, I forgot which particular product it is, but uh, point is there is a total thing which really depends upon manufacturing, transportation, product use, recycling facilities. And the interesting thing is overall cycle, 30 percent is the operation. This is what normally when we talk about low power design, low power circuits, low power software, all this stuff, it's really focusing on a third of the problem. There is this whole rest of a two third, which also you really ought to uh, think about if you are in a product design kind of uh, thing. So let's walk through briefly what kind of issues which come up out there. So for example, when it comes to manufacturing, using less material. Uh, one of the things you might recall, sort of Apple often sort of talks about unibody construction and all. Part of the thing is it minimizes <coughs> material wastage and all. So there's some benefits there. Uh, toxic substances, uh, electronics uh, for the longest while, PCBs and all use some pretty nasty chemicals and their disposal and all in turn cost uh, added to the energy costs. Uh, so environmental implications and all. And so just generally the manufacturing phase itself could be done uh, sloppily or can be significantly improved. Then it comes to transportation. Uh, sounds little, but when you take hundreds of millions of products that, uh, put together, they are being shipped on a 48 hour notice from China in a uh, um, uh, sort of energy hungry great aircraft and all. It's a lot of energy being done. Uh, so, lighter products, smaller packaging, all of those things little by little kind of contribute and I think again manufacturers have sort of uh, paid a lot of lot of uh, attention to that. So uh, packaging sort of plays a big role. Then sub product use, this is where normally sort of uh, we work with. So more efficient processor, better displays, better power supplies, ability to modulate. Uh, brightness of display, spinning down days, all these kind of things. And the energy cert start certification that you see is really kind of focused on this particular uh, 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 this particular part uh, of the story. Uh, so a uh, lot of lot of stuff, lot of techniques have happened which sort of have catered to this. Uh, like for example, display brightness <laughs> being modulated as a function of what some sort of ambient light sensor is sensing, so there's an automated brightness control, uh, wake on demand kind of technique, so like instead of keeping the radio up all the time, with some coordination with the wireless access point, uh, optimizing that. Power supply efficiency, that actually is a biggie. Not every power adapter, I mean, just because it gives you K watt at some voltage are equivalent, there are significant differences in efficiency. Cheaper ones are worse, typically, just because they are have inferior circuits and all. Uh, so when you see, oh, why am I paying a uh, $50 adapter versus a $10 adapter on Amazon, there are differences on these things. So it might, your cost may be lower, but over the lifetime, you're just pay, paying that back in efficiency. Uh, so a lot of work happened uh, in this space because efficiency of the power supply used to be pretty rotten. And again, a lot of improvements have happened there. Uh, automated graph, uh, graph graphic board switching, so like a lot of laptops, including my current laptop for example, it has a very energy hungry GPU and then it has an integrated GPU and it kind of switches back and forth between those two kind of depending upon what I'm doing. So the goal is, again, this is energy proportionality. And one of the techniques that from the example I'm giving is that it's very hard to make a single GPU energy proportional because the high end GPU in this thing is extremely, uh, lots of force and just extreme. So uh, even if you were to scale it down, it has its baseline power is too high. So what uh, the OS out there does is, depending upon the kind of application I'm running and all, it basically at some stage says, you know, I'm better off switching to this uh, less capable GPU because the workload that I'm typically doing is sufficient for that. And only when I may be running a game or some particularly graphic intensive stuff, does it switch over to that. Uh, Finally, a lot of work towards 
standby power optimization uh, that has happened, which is uh, how much the system consumes when literally it is not doing anything, but I'm just sufficiently vigilant. So a lot of optimizations uh, that have happened there in all type of products, even though I'm just picking uh, Apple as an example, mostly because I got these graphics for free from the website. Uh, recycling measure, measures, so it's the back end of the story. Uh, product recyclability in terms of the materials used, are the materials recyclable? Um, uh, batteries, great example, a big improvement in recent four or five years is how many charge discharge cycles the batteries are able to survive. One of the things you'll see a bit later in the course is that rechargeable batteries, they age. So every time you charge discharge, their capacity kind of degrades. And um, uh, the current industry standard tends to be that once the battery degrades to 80% capacity, what it means is that if you recharge, now it is the energy it is storing is 80% of what it used to be when the battery was new. So once the battery degrades to that level, uh, it is treated as having degraded uh, so much as to have outlived. Okay, so that's kind of the lifetime of the battery in a different sense that it has aged a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, if you have uh, Apple laptop or iPhone or wherever, and if a battery is giving you a problem, if you take it to Apple store, the test they do is precisely this, okay? So if it is still within the two year period or whatever they uh, warranty it for, and if it has retained its 80% thing, they will declare it, it's fine, it's within the spec. Um, so what has happened is that emission has improved a lot. It used to be a couple of hundred cycles or so, and now batteries comfortably do maybe 1,000, 1,500 cycles. And what changed was, in this case, it was material advances. So material is still deep down some lithium ion chemistry, but the impurities in it. So as they were able to make the process better, uh, the batteries kind of last longer. Uh, and of course, better recycling methods and all. And then finally, uh, the facilities themselves, uh, which are used in this process. So. Um, what kind of energy was used in the production, those kind of things. And so, so a lot of this is back end, right? I mean, you have to somehow account for these things uh, um, um, as the energy, net energy footprint of a, of a product. Okay, so that's the story on the computing side. Like I said, we'll sort of go into uh, a lot of these things in uh, detail, but much of the course really is about the product use phase, that is where the center of gravity is for us. Uh, but I do want you to encourage through uh, possible project ideas and all, if you want to look at some of these other aspects. We are, but the thing is, the incremental cost, so you may still be, see, manufacturing and all also is kind of like a very highly non energy proportional process. So the mere fact that you decided to make a phone suddenly results in a baseline cost. The cost of an extra chip probably adds a tiny clip to it. Okay, so uh, this is a complicated analysis, and again, uh, I mean, uh, these companies spend a fair bit of time and effort doing it. Uh, there was a term that I forget, but Hewlett Packard, I mean, I recall in early days, Hewlett Packard was pushing this kind of analysis a lot. They were sort of doing pioneering this. Apple was quite a bit of a late comer in this game. But nowadays, I mean, I think companies pride themselves on this, uh, on these rankings and all. So, in fact, uh, latest ranking I think I just read like a week ago or so where you know, I mean, yeah, Apple uh, sort of did pretty well in that. So they have paid a lot of attention, but so do a lot of other vendors. But typical cheaper ones, not so much. Okay, so uh, um, the f other side of the story which kind of um, uh, we are going to look at in this course is that uh, uh, a lot of these things we are talking about as you can see the data insight that data provides and all is a big part of the role. And likewise, the software that manages the operation is a big part of the story. And so what all that says is that computational intelligence is perhaps in part an answer to making things more energy aware, more energy sustainable and all. So that's the uh, flip side of the thing, which is um, uh, that uh, what this plot is trying to show is that um, uh, for certain type of system, there is some someone did some analysis, some agency, uh, that there is an effect you can quantify as to how much 
would be the positive impact of computational techniques in reducing the carbon footprint and these kind of things. Okay, you can really kind of quantify that, making our buildings more efficient, making our cars more efficient, uh, and stuff like that. So. So, uh, information technology in that sense does have a uh, significant um, sort of positive effect uh, by just making things uh, smart. And the whole the, the smart grid concept really is about that we take this dumb electrical grid and then by putting computational intelligence in it, we really make it more energy efficient. And the same thing can be said about a lot of other things. Electric vehicles, for example, are a di direct outcome of our ability to manage batteries extremely well. Okay, the whole drive, drive, drive process that happens there, shifting of load from one electric motor to another, those kind of things. Uh, and the same story is played out in system after system after system. Uh, so, uh, more broadly, information technology has enabled uh, society wide. Uh, energy reduction in a variety of ways. So one is this concept of dematerialization. That is, instead of moving uh, physical things around, um, which resulting cost in um, sort of material movement, kinetic energy, um, we begin to replace them by moving information <coughs> around. Uh, so Netflix or um, sort of. Um, Moving, moving. Uh, I mean, what one of the things you often read about is 3D printing, and all is also part of enabling a future like that. Um, and then also things like smarter actuators, smarter buildings, smart grids. All of these things are examples where we make sort of computational intelligence into physical systems to make them more energy efficient. Just to take an example, buildings. So. Buildings account for actually a fair bit of energy footprint. Uh, and so just in this country, for example, buildings are 40% or so of the total energy, 70 plus percent of the total electricity, um, third or so of the natural gas, a uh, fair amount of the water usage, and water in turn has significant energy footprint and all. So kind of idea uh, being that if we can uh, optimize usage of a bunch of these resources that buildings which and in turn occupants of the building use, then we can have a significant impact because it's just in the aggregate uh, that there is a there is a lot of it. And just like any other system, buildings are extremely energy non-proportional. So now how might we define utilization in a building? Uh, it's a bit of a complicated thing, but you could argue that uh, one thing could be that number of people who are using the building. If one person is using it versus uh, the peak capacity, there should be some correspondence between those. What is the building doing? Now, some, there are complicating factors. If you look at a building like, let's say, Boulder Hall, so certainly it has classrooms and all, which you could articulate in terms of this kind of proportionality. One class taking place versus 10 class taking place, one student being taught versus 10. But there are also things in a building which need to be up for safety, security, those kind of purposes. So just even if a single person is in a building, there is a certain baseline cost you have to just kind of do. So it's a complicated story, but people have studied this. So like at the top is a plot from uh, UC San Diego CSC building, and at the bottom from Berkeley's CSC building. Uh, the reason they both happen to be CS buildings is because pretty much the first people to begin to analyze these things were the computer scientists. Okay, so they kind of instrumented these buildings with tons of sensors and all and began to kind of see that, you know, what, what is happening in these things because there are a lot of conventional wisdom and then when you put sensors and all, you learn, you are, you, you are hit with surprises. So, uh, in the San Diego one, they found that roughly 70% of the load were PCs and servers in the building, okay. Uh, so the conventional wisdom has been that office buildings are dominated by HVAC and lighting, but not true for information technology intense buildings. And their CSE building is probably very typical of the kind of buildings you encounter in more knowledge-heavy industries. Okay, uh, Soda Hall, which is a Berkeley CS building, same story. Roughly half the plug load there were just the laptops and the desktops. Okay, and this is not even counting servers and all. So office equipment. Uh, as computerization has penetrated, has become a significant uh, thing. At my own home, I have tried this exercise once where I just consciously just 
shut off everything which is you would consider as a major appliance okay so just uh, fridge shut off and all and still the baseline load of my home was around one and a half kilowatt uh, which is quite significant and this is basically a whole bunch of little little devices and all i roughly at my home network one day i counted i have close to 200 ip addresses okay so don't ask me what all they are but i just have tons of stuff and these little 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 things they kind of just add up and by the time you look at it this, this uh, so i think i think this world where we just have gazillion devices for personal is um, pretty much there and so unknowingly we just consume a lot of energy so so these conventional big appliances are actually kind of a minor part of the story uh, in many cases. So what's been happening um, in kind of this space uh, is a lot of effort towards uh, making buildings more energy efficient. And they essentially kind of uh, um, boil down to a few set of um, techniques very broadly. Um, uh, one obviously is uh, I make the hardware more efficient. So if I'm using old HVACs and old ovens and old dishwashers and whatnot, just switching to newer technology because a lot of the stuff is more energy efficient now. Another big cause is lack of maintenance, okay, failures and aging and leakage and stuff like that. And then finally, the third one is managing the process of energy consumption. Uh, better modifying the behavior of users and these kind of things. A lot of studies done in this space, and again, you'll have a lecture by Bharat at some point in the course that there's a big human factor out here. Uh, in fact, studies have shown things like people who live in buildings where the metering is centralized, and then the bill is uh, these are rental buildings, and the bill is just divided up uh, among the different apartments, either equally or based upon the square footage or something like that such buildings the average person consumes more energy when there is direct apartment level billing which is happening I mean, it's kind of a natural thing you might imagine but the thing is once you meter people are conscious there is another uh, so-called prius effect anyone heard of this uh, prius was the hot hybrid car uh, so uh, the so-called prius effect and the reason there was that prius was one of the first cars which would show on a continual real-time basis as to what your energy efficiency is. Nowadays, it's pretty common, but I'm talking about 10, 12 years ago when Prius had first appeared and they were going to bring this. And it turned out that people again became conscious. So things like hard accelerations and all, which are fun, but they actually are pretty bad from an energy perspective that people began to do. And I mean, nowadays, people with their plugins and these sort of things, there are all sort of interesting energy games people play, like, for example, can I have my plug-in hybrid go forever so that I never have to put gasoline, uh, stuff like that. So just a change in the psychology that happens when information is put in front of you. Um, uh, other kind of studies, like people have done smart thermostats and all, where when you're setting the thermostat thing, okay, I'm feeling cold, this is plus 50, 74 degree or something like that. Versus if the thermostat were to show that, you know, if you were to reduce it by one degree, you will save so much money and then people react to that. Um, there's a big study, uh, which probably still is going on here at UCLA, one of the biggest of its kind. Uh, it's called Engage. Uh, it's done by Professor Bill Kaiser's group. Some of you are in that group. Um, uh, together with uh, Margaret Dalmer's uh, professor in economics here. So these, uh, these guys have been running a big study in UCLA residential housing and all, where they do exactly these kind of things. What's the impact of these kind of insights. So like for example in residence halls they do things like leaderboards and all like which room or which wing of the dorm how energy efficient they are. They kind of essentially create a competition out of it and uh, then see how people react. So main thing is there are a variety of techniques you could bring to use uh, to modify behavior but all of that requires the ability to measure and then ability to influence uh, the human behavior of that and lots of work in recent decade has kind of focused on that. So that's in context of buildings and I kind of referred to cars, but there are similar kind of things you can imagine uh, in a whole whole bunch of other, other settings. So generally we individuals, humans, we react to information 
and some of us who are really hardened, we really need money to be motivated, okay? So these are the two things. I mean, information is the first cut thing that we are well intentioned, but if we don't know, then we don't uh, behave properly. And the other one is that maybe we still don't care, then some incentive, uh, money, public shaming, some, something like that kind of help you move further along. So that's, that's that right hand corner. But all of these things end up requiring information technology, okay? I mean, if you look at all these three boxes, uh, identifying degradation and failures and all, okay? So a complicated building, these big buildings and all, they have all sort of failures which happen. Most of the time, they are not even noticed because these are complicated system. A building like this probably has a few thousand sensors and actuators and all what's happening and things fail and all. Uh, so historically, complicated systems have been managed by a periodic maintenance schedule. Every so much time, six months or whatever, there will be an inspection and if you find something, we'll replace it and then move on. One of the things which has begun to happen is if you have the ability to sense, then you begin to move towards what is called as a condition-based maintenance paradigm. So when a leakage begins to happen or something begins to fail, immediately you are able to kind of go and fix it. And uh, so IT plays a role there. And likewise, information technology here has been very useful. Uh, so one of one of the ways of so, so some of these things are obvious, right? I mean, I buy a more efficient stuff and all. But some things that turn out to be more subtle. So when you have the more efficient gizmo, a more efficient computer, a more efficient whatever HVAC unit and all, there's a rated capacity. But that rated capacity is for some particular idealized average user. That may or may not work for you. So there are, um, uh, so how would the computer do on my workload as opposed to a generic workload? How would the HVAC do in my building, in my uh, particular workload environment than in a generic setting? So again, information technology in the sense of ability to sense and measure and all, turn out to provide a lot of guidance. So there are a lot of companies and all who do things like uh, uh, sort of quick energy analytics of your building, okay? And then they will provide you feedback on what measures you can take, what should you replace, what's the most cost-effective way of making things more energy efficient. Uh, in fact, kind of a couple of quasi former UCLA startups have been in the space in the sense our graduates who or other elsewhere they have created startups. So there's a startup in India called Zenetrix or something like that. They, their whole business is like that. They basically go to companies and they base, uh, their basic deal is we are going to analyze your whole enterprise and we are going to give you recommendations on energy savings and we are going to share in the energy savings, whatever money you are saving. Uh, there's a similar startup by a former student of mine who was a uh, faculty at Yale. Uh, he had a similar model out, out here in the US and I know of several others. So the model out here is bring to bear sensing plus machine <coughs> learning data analysis to essentially take these complicated systems, uh, kind of make the energy consumption processes within that visible and then help improve them. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so that was buildings. Um, uh, another area where uh, uh, this thing has happened of making a physical system more efficient is the electrical grid. So electrical grid is obviously sort of uh, really, really, really old technology, but the main thing is historically, it's basically been about a one-way flow of electricity. A very complicated one, you have generators and sort of you go through this uh, transmission network which is high voltage and then finally at the edge you go through this distribution network, but the point is it's a one-way traffic. Utility estimates what the usage would be, they perhaps buy electricity and all from the things and uh, from the generators and then they arrange for the supply to happen. Um, and energy sources are what are called as dispatchable. What dispatchable means is that these are resources which on demand I can bring them on or off. So uh, a natural gas fired generator would be an example of that. On a reasonably short notice, I can activate and deactivate it. There will be cost for doing it, but they are dispatchable in the sense they are controllable when they are active or not. And then the loads are oblivious. That is, loads will consume whatever they are. They, unless there is a manual intervention, they don't adapt. So for example, your HVAC does not know that there is 
uh, severe heat going on and there's a shortage of electricity and that perhaps it should be more polite and operate at a lower setting. That's not what happens unless I as a human intervene and kind of react to it and certainly some of that <coughs> some of that can take place. There might be whatever announcements on television that high risk of blackouts happening, sort of turn off your ACs and stuff like that and then people react to it. But there is no automated system normally for this kind of process. Some one way flow of electricity and that's it. Uh, what has, uh, when we hear about uh, smart grid, there are few, uh, all, all these assumptions begin to be changed and again computing technology plays a big role. So it's no longer just flow of energy, it is also flow of information. It's no longer simply dispatchable energy resources, but energy resources which are non-dispatchable, namely the renewable type stuff, wind and solar. They, we cannot control, uh, like I said last time, we cannot control when the sun rises. And and then nodes which are not oblivious, they're adaptable. So smart grid basically begins to refer to these things. So uh, the sources which are not dispatchable and which are intermittent. Uh, so the way computing plays a role out here is our ability to predict things. Uh, what would the weather be like tomorrow? How much sunshine would be there? How much wind would be there? All those kind of predictions and all come into play. So huge role of analytics at different time scale that happens out there. So um, sort of people just like you try to predict stock market price and all, there is an enormous thing out here because of the whole energy market. In California and in Europe, there are uh, energy markets where people bid for energy and the spot markets and all. Last time I referred to that energy prices can even go to negative. So uh, essentially it's a commodity which is purchased much like gold and silver and all. and Therefore, your ability to predict matters and that's what utilities and generators and all do. So that's uh, data and analytics sort of come into play. Um, then another aspect of this, uh, so you're trying to create kind of a balanced ecosystem of uh, load and uh, sources out there. Um, so uh, uh, if, if you... Uh, uh, look at the overall sort of uh, footprint right now. Uh, now this slide is somewhat old, I think four or five years old. But this thing with the point is we still have long ways to go. And one of the resistance to integration of these uh, intermittent, uh, non-dispatchable renewable type thing is precisely this issue that they, that it, the integration causes uh, instability into the grid. It makes pricing and all much harder. And uh, like I alluded to last time, grid scale energy storage is still relatively costly. So that's what makes this problem complicated. Uh, but again, analytics and all are placing a huge role. Uh, there's a lot of work here in mechanical engineering, for example, on this kind of stuff. Um, uh, okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, as you might imagine, there's a lot of patterns in this thing, like for example, if you look at solar energy, time of day obviously matters a lot. Uh, or like if you look at wind, uh, again time of day matters a lot. Interestingly, they're complementary during daytime winds are quieter, uh, nighttime winds are there and obviously sun is out. So uh, if you have ability to make these predictions and all, then as a utility you can basically say, you know, how much is my baseline thing, solar plus wind, and then the excess is what I need to purchase or uh, to dirty electricity for which maybe I have to pay carbon tax and stuff like that. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a complex market which uh, where data uh, provides the knowledge for you to play intelligently. Um, so what's happening in the smart grid then and which is how computation will play is that you have some generation capability and all. You probably have some storage capability and this is kind of complicated these two things because uh, it used to be that generation and storage might be centralized but now what you also have is lots of people have their own local storage and local generation even down to the household level and moreover in many states there are laws which obligate the electrical grid to purchase energy back from you so if i have a solar panel at home and if I'm producing excess energy, which my home is not consuming, then LADWP is obligated to buy back my electricity at a certain set price. So there can be an outflow of 
electricity from me to the grid. Besides issues that I may be pumping dirty electricity out there, not at the right frequency and stuff like that. What this also means is that because of this legal obligation, predicting what the generation portfolio is and what the, that, that becomes a complicated thing. Storage is an interesting one. So grid scale storage is hard, but one of the things that people have been doing is they're saying that, look, now we have so many uh, electric vehicles and perhaps the batteries in them can be used as part of the storage thing. So let's say I drive in uh, to my workplace, I park my car, uh, I need to make sure that my car has a certain percentage of energy, but maybe during the daytime and all, it could be that at times it could supply energy back to the grid and then at other times it could uh, take energy back and some intelligent entity can manage this, this whole process. So uh, there's a center here at UCLA called Smirk, Smart, something, something, Energy Research Center. Um, uh, a lot of stuff they are doing is along this line. In fact, if you look at the rooftop of uh, parking lot nine now, there are huge solar panels that they have constructed out there. And that's essentially an experiment at foot in that direction. Uh, so they're trying to do things like, uh, along the lines of what I mentioned, which is uh, uh, they will manage, but uh, provide you uh, sort of energy and all, but in return, they will also do things like use your battery in the car for these other purposes. There are lots of interesting implications behind this. Like for example, the battery life of my car is being degraded and things like that. So a lot of those things have to be worked out, but there are a lot of attempts happening in this area. Final one is demand response, which is a very explicit uh, economically driven way of uh, changing people's behavior, which is basically telling them right now electricity is so much, there's a pricing signal, and also telling them that under some contractual obligation, you have to reduce an energy consumption. So there's a back and forth, there's a network. Uh, your meter in your home is continually communicating through some wireless network to the utility <laughs> and it's getting messages and all. And when it receives a message, then in turn, it informs all the appliances in your home. So it will tell your fridge that, okay, go into a lower uh, lower mode, for lower energy consumption mode. So a lot of this kind of stuff which is happening. So price sensitive load, frequencies to response to sort of just the signals that you are getting. Again, in California, there is a uh, legal mandate with uh, buildings which have a certain amount of energy footprint. Uh, have to be demand response compliant and there are communication standards which have been designed for this and also your uh, there's, a, there's a rich back and forth communication which sort of happens at the stage. So the overall story which has been happening driven by networking and ability to analyze data and all is that we are moving from loads which were basically blind to whatever was happening on the grid to loads which are continually adapting. Okay, so it is getting better. So this is again part of an energy proportionality story, but at a really at a grid scale. And similar stories playing out with electric vehicles. When should they charge? Stuff like that um, are again part of the same 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 same. Same, same kind of thing which is happening. So ultimately, what is happening in these grids and closed these electric systems, buildings and electric vehicles is that we are using computing to help match supply and load and help sort of the whole system be stable, high quality and energy efficient. So what's happening in some sense is one way of thinking of, uh, about it is the grid at this stage is not only kind of a network for energy, but it's also a network for uh, information. And one of the other things which has happened is energy flow is no longer one direction. It is actually more like peer to peer. Um, solar panels at my home might be supplying the energy to your nearby home because I had excess energy and you had an excess load. And again, so, so it's really a very complicated uh, network which has emerged as a result. Okay, so to conclude this introductory part, um, uh, I think what I find personally kind of interesting is that energy uh, kind of is not simply this runtime management 
technical only story, which is actually a pretty rich story with lots of uh, implications with the way our economy functions, the way uh, things are happening in all systems at all scale, and these systems themselves are coupled. Um, and uh, this dual role I find interesting, namely making computers sort of better in terms of energy. If nothing else, I would like my smartwatch and phone to last for days. So there's a personal sort of uh, interest in a way. But then there is a huge uh, sort of a societal angle also. So lots of systems which were historically extremely polluting, extremely inefficient, can improve quite a bit with sensing and computing and analysis and those sort of things. Uh, and one takeaway in terms of the principle, which I think applies to really a broad range of systems, is this concept of energy proportionality, which is we design systems for some anticipated peak level, but the system spends very little time at that peak level. And therefore, if you were to do not, if, if you were to just leave it like that, then most of the time your system is actually operating in its very inefficient regime. And therefore, you have to do something to make stuff, uh, yeah, make, make your overall system more, uh, more efficient. And there are basically a couple of ways that have emerged around it. So firstly, the way this does not work is to seek to make a monolithic component to be energy proportional because just none of these things are. So two principles that we kind of saw in passing and we'll do it in more depth later on. One is that make a system out of a lot of tiny parts and then shut down some fraction of those parts and have some smart strategy to sort of scale that. And that's where your operating system sort of comes into play. And the other one is to make a, make a system of heterogeneous parts. So my processor is really maybe three or four processors with different performance and power curves, and then I switch back and forth between them. So a term you may have heard of is this big dot little processor, which I think I talked about in two or two way also. So these are examples where I take two things with sort of somewhat uh, uh, overlapping characteristics, but otherwise kind of this, this, this joint. So they provide me very distinct operating points, and depending upon my workload, I can kind of switch between those. And we see examples of this again and again in many different contexts. Uh, big dot little in processors, modern ACs at homes are now multi-stage HVACs, which are basically stages optimized for different levels of performance. So we scale the performance. One uh, other thing which we'll again see is from an energy management perspective, there are at some level two strategies that you can think of. One is so-called sprinting strategy, which is I need to do some work. I run as fast as I can, finish it as quickly as possible, and then shut down, rest. And the other is I just run just at the right speed to finish it just, at, just in a timely manner. And which one works better and which one not is a complicated story. It depends upon a lot of factors and all. Um, in some classes of systems, the sprinting strategy, that is do things as quickly as possible and shut down works better in other classes of systems, the scaling story. I scale my performance to just match the workload requirement works better. And we'll see that again and again in all these different kinds of systems. So if if there are any, uh, I'm the closest to having some key principles for power management, these are the ones I would cite, okay, that uh, this whole energy proportionality concept and how you achieve it, break things down into tiny parts, or do this heterogeneous stuff, and the other one being this sprinting versus scaling strategy. So, uh, uh, so that's kind of uh, hopefully some of these things we'll see in the course, uh, both in computing and a lot in context of buildings for sure, and perhaps some other systems. Okay, so uh, you guys want to take up a short break? Let's do that. Five minutes. So. Uh, the first thing we are going to do is to begin to get some sense of where is the energy consumed. Now there are sort of two purposes behind this exercise. One is of course uh, knowing how the energy is consumed kind of gives you some sense of what do we need to do. Uh, but the other part also is that um, management of energy consumption 
uh, whether it's being done in the OS or in the smart grid or whatnot, it's really kind of like a control system I'm, I'm, uh, or optimization problem, right? I mean, either a static optimization, runtime optimization. And what and that in turn means is that I need to have some sort of a model of how the energy is being consumed. What knob should I control? What's the effect of changing something on the energy consumption? Because only if I change the voltage and frequency, what happens to performance and energy consumption? Those, those kind of analysis I should do. So, uh, so that would be our goal. And again, we'll spend a fair bit of time looking at computing and then other systems. I just had a question about the, the heterogeneous uh, system you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, the company, company like say maybe an Amazon or someone who's like very consumer facing, very you know, aggressive uh, product cycle, how, where does this, I guess in terms of like current trends, you know where this, where something like heterogeneous type system ranks on the uh, I mean they use the chips which have heterogeneity already in them for example, so okay. it's very common nowadays that you have uh, very, as in the past two, three years, that for mobile devices a lot of these chips have uh, heterogeneous architecture. Uh, so that's, that's that's one example. You see it. Uh, I mean, thinking again of Amazon um, in their data center kind of thing. They, uh, in the data center, it's probably less heterogeneity and more of that statistical multiplexing is probably what they're using. What other products Amazon makes? Uh, I guess Amazon is ultimately also about a lot of dematerialization. That may folks becoming electronics and stuff like that. But heterogeneity mostly in the devices. Okay, so. Uh, where does the energy go? Uh, and uh, uh, so, one one thing obviously is that uh, computation requires energy. Okay. Now it turns out that there's a long history of physicists worrying about energy in computing. And in fact, this could be kind of those of you who are a bit more uh, let's say scientifically inclined. Might be an interesting topic to pursue. In fact, the person who wrote a lot about this topic was Richard Feynman, a kind of famous physicist. Uh, he has this book called Physics of Computing, and a lot of work happened at IBM. So, uh, we, as electrical in electrical engineering, and I guess to some extent computer science, we learn about energy and communication a fair bit. We all uh, if you look at Shannon's capacity equation, it has the rate and it also has energy. We always think of a computing communication in terms of the so-called EB over N naught metric, which is energy per bit divided by the noise flow. Uh, so uh, communication needs energy, uh, rate and uh, what is it, data rate or information rate that we can achieve. Um, is a function of the energy we are willing to consume. But we usually don't talk about energy behind computing. Now, it turns out that unlike communication, which where to communicate a certain distance, you do need a certain amount of energy, computing actually is different. In fact, <coughs> computing can be done in a manner which is a reversible process. So if any of you remember your thermodynamics, a reversible process is one where when I do something, energy moves from one direction and then I can reverse it, I can move the energy back. So in theory, computing can be done in that manner, leaving aside a slight philosophical issue that computing requires communication and therefore can't quite do that. But uh, ignoring that, you could. And uh, so at least from a physics sense, there's a lot of work in this area called reversible computing which basically is this concept that I can spend energy in one part of computing and then I recover it in the other part. And a closely related field has been something called adiabatic computing. And our neighbors at Caltech and USC, they have historically done quite a bit of work in that space. So upshot of all of this is that if you are willing to do computation very slowly, then you could do computation with zero energy in an idealized setting, okay? so. Um, as I slow computing down to do the same work, I'll need less and less energy. Leaving aside all of that, uh, from a practical perspective, if we do have timing constraints and stuff like that and all, um, yeah, we spend energy and besides the fact that we computing and communication are so closely entangled that uh, that separation isn't there. And then finally, uh, most computing that we know requires some sort of clock 
a timing signal which needs to be propagated, which is basically information uh, going everywhere saying, now do something, right? Uh, synchronization. And that again costs energy. In fact, in a lot of systems, the clock signal takes a lot of energy. Those of you designing synchronous chips are probably well aware of this. Uh, so now when we look at computing in a realistic manner, various way, places where you find computing, you would see that it occurs at different scales. I mean, there are computers which are at watts and hundreds of watts or even higher scale. There are mobile devices which are kind of in milliwatt type things, and then you have sensors and implantables and all which are in microwatt and nanowatt. Is perhaps uh, potential in future even lower level. Uh, so uh, our, our man-made computers scale a wide spectrum clearly. Um, in nature also you find computing namely our brains. So our brain is roughly 2% of our body's mass. It consumes 20% of the power. Our body essentially dissipates or uh, consumes around 100 watt. A very typical model that building engineers uh, do use is that a individual in a room is essentially a 100 watt heat generator. Okay, so that's how they kind of account for us. Uh, so power conversion of brain is around 20 watts. Brain does roughly 10 to the power 16 operations per second because we have so many of these neurons and they're kind of firing. You know, they fire at millisecond scale, but there's so many of them. They're trying to add everything up. Uh, so we have 10 to the power 15 synapses operating at 10 impulses per second. So energy per operation is 2 femtojoule per hour. Uh, by comparison, okay, replaced recently by three years ago, uh, Cortex M0 Plus, which I think even now is among the most efficient of the microcontrollers. I think in 2 or 2A, those of you recall, I think someone has presented, I think it was Vikrantano, the Risk Five from Berkeley, which was more efficient, but you are basically looking at a processor which represents uh, one of the most energy efficient processors around. It's around nine microamp per megahertz, it's probably at one, okay, it's one and a half volt. So all of this translates into 13.5 picojoules per hour versus two femtojoules per hour. So we are basically four order of magnitude apart uh, between what nature, existence proof of nature versus what our most efficient processors currently do. And uh, it's not a particularly powerful processor, okay? I mean, we're really looking at um, thinky thinky microcontroller uh, stuff. Uh, so long ways to go. And this is what has led to a lot of interest in recent years on what I was mentioning last uh, picture, uh, the so-called neuromorphic architecture. That is perhaps by designing our computers, analogously to the brain, we could achieve similar efficiency. I think much of it remains still aspirational than reality, but at least it's motivating a lot of research. There are huge projects at EPFL in Switzerland, at IBM, the Synapse project. Qualcomm actually made a lot of noise about their latest Snapdragon chips having this neuronal processor, but I think a lot of it is this marketing gimmick. Uh, and then there is, um, uh, UC San Diego are doing a lot of work. Uh, there are people who are doing digital realizations of the brain and then there are people who are actually doing an entire analog level stuff. So there's a lot, lot of stuff going on and it's all driven by uh, precisely kind of this thing. Uh, at one extreme, I mean IBM in a purely digital regime uh, with some specialized chips and all is essentially trying to do a real-time simulation of a human brain, like literally that many neurons and all sort of being coupled together. So there's a lot of work going on. Uh, DARPA, which is the big defense funding agency, <coughs> they had ever a big program called DARPA Synapse Program in the past four or five years where a lot of progress in this direction has happened. Um, yeah, and brain, the idea is that at least brain excels in what I would loosely refer to as signal processing, learning, machine, sort of machine learning, that those kind of tasks. And so the as the, the hope is that we can design machines which are as good. Um, this is kind of a nice plot of showing where different things we like, the human brain, the fastest supercomputer, iPad 2, iPad 2, cat brain, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so kind of all over the map in terms of where, where they are. The numbers here are different just because uh, data from different sources tend to be slightly different. Um, okay. 
Another uh, thing that I wanted to point out, and this is something that um, I've often found that um, many students stumble upon or are at least not very careful about, is that energy versus power. Uh, colloquially, we often replace them. Often I do when I'm talking low power or low energy and whatnot. But these are obviously two very different physical quantities, right? I mean, power is the rate of energy consumption. So. Um, so, 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 so you have to keep that in mind and again kind of a quick um, uh, review of the underlying kind of the physics of uh, uh, the circuit behind it. So you have potential difference which occurs between two points in a circuit or two points in a system. Uh, you have the current flowing between them, so which is the rate at which the charge is flowing. You have the resistance which is provided to that flow. Uh, then power is the rate of energy expenditure and energy is the integral of that power expenditure. Um, <coughs> so one has to be very careful because these goals of low energy and low power need not be the same. I can have a system which is low energy but perhaps consumes a lot of power for the duration it's consuming energy. Okay, I run for a short time but run consuming a lot of uh, high uh, consuming a high power level uh, while, I'm, while I'm running. Uh, and uh, the flip side, like the example I gave was that if I'm willing to do computation extremely slowly, then essentially I can do con uh, computation at zero energy, okay? So just bear this thing in mind, the power versus energy, because they are used interchangeably, but uh, they are distinct things. Uh, which one is better as, uh, the metric to use kind of depends. Uh, applications which are transactional, namely like database applications and stuff like that, uh, or like a sam samples which are being processed, they're probably better defined in terms of throughput and average power. On the other hand, completion and energy consumed are more useful for non-transactional applications where I have to do a particular task, I have to compile a file. So it's not like I'm worrying about compiling multiple files. I have a particular task to do, and I could just focus on how much energy it takes, subject to some completion time. Um, power consumption can often be increased um, uh, to, uh, over a short period, but overall energy will be minimized. So I can run very rapidly for a short period of time and may come out ahead. On the other hand, if I were to drag things out, even though my power level may be lower, I may be worse off. So for example, let's say I have to do a task, like do a big compilation of a big piece of software. Am I better off running my computer at a very high frequency and it finishes very quickly and then I'm done, I shut it off, versus am I better off running at a low frequency, which is often touted as more power efficient, uh, but it's going to take a longer time. What do you think? So, Again, am I better off, this goes back to the thing, am I better off sprinting or am I better off doing the marathon? Or what fact, what property of the system do you think might make me go one way or the other? Huh? Well, so let's imagine, so I have certain time, right? So uh, I could stretch myself to take all that time and just operate at a slow speed, right? Uh, and assuming like in the extreme case that time is very far out, so I can really operate at the slowest speed setting of my system. But my alternative is run very rapidly, run at the highest frequency and I finish very early and then I shut the system off, right? So my question is what property of the system would make one regime better than the other? You would expect it to work at the What do you mean? I, I mean in terms of uh, base is somewhat application dependent, right? So if you, if you there's like a floor server uh -huh. or something like that that is expected to have a high load or has a high load. No, no, so again, uh, I have I have a certain deadline. If you finish early, it's fine. Uh, you don't get any brownie points as long as you don't finish more than that. So the load doesn't enter the picture. Baseline power consumption. Yeah, baseline power consumption. So if you think about it, my system really has, uh, if you recall that energy proportionality plot, there was a y intercept, so let's take the baseline power. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to pay just for merely keeping the system on. 
And then after that, I had this kind of a linear component which I had shown, but it doesn't have to be linear, but it will be something which is a function of the load I'm actually putting. So if my baseline power consumption is very high, then its integral over the duration I am on is going to be huge. If on the other hand, baseline power is extremely low or small enough, then all of it is coming from the scaling component. So in systems where baseline power is very high, which strategy is better? Sprint it, right? Do it as soon as possible. If on the other hand, baseline power is extremely low, then essentially my scaling is that better. Use up all the time. And we'll see that later, but again, this is this as you can imagine, this principle applies to every system. I mean, it's again one of the uh, if you just think about any power management of any system, we'll say specifically. Uh, the, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, when you buy components, again, very loosely speaking, we say, oh, this is a low power sensor or a low power processor or a low power blah, blah, blah. Uh, you, you should also always think about it. Is your goal low power or low energy? And low power may not necessarily mean better off because what is that lower power coming for? So let's say I may have two processors and we'll see examples of it. A lower power processor may have a simpler architecture, maybe 8-bit, maybe lacking some operations and therefore to do the same work, you may actually need more instructions and all and so from an energy perspective, you may be far worse off uh, by picking this lower power processor. So there's something, something to keep in mind. So power, energy kind of uh, play out in many ways. Energy versus computational complexity. This is also often uh, becomes an issue. So are the two distinct? So what I mean by that is that is it the case that a program which takes or an algorithm which takes more operations is necessarily worse off from the perspective of energy? And the answer is not really, depends upon what those operations work. Uh, not all operations are equally uh, are, are, are equally intense in terms of um, the energy footprint. Um, so, but generally speaking, you could say that energy consumption and computation time, they both increase with number of instructions, number of memory access, <coughs> number of IO operations, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so for example, in many processors, people have shown things like if you change the order of instructions, that can affect energy, but it won't affect the completion, completion time. And the reason has to do with, uh, as we'll see later on, that when energy consumption and all requires movement of charge, so capacitance being charged, discharge, so the ordering of instructions often ends up impacting what is happening at the circuit level in the energy consumption. Uh, uh, in fact, even uh, operand values may matter and things like that. So this relationship is not necessarily one is to one. Uh, the other thing is modern processors have some tremendously complicated power management features at the lowest level. So, okay, they shut down things at really fine granularity. For example, inside a processor, they might look at what instructions are in the pipeline and then based upon that, shut down parts of the processor do, using a technique called clock gating where you shut off clock to part of the processor and all. So all these complicated things come into play. Net effect is that while to the first order, it's perhaps not a bad assumption that uh, number of instructions taken is what, uh, as an indicator of energy used as well, but these different factors that not all instructions are the same and that ordering of the instructions matter uh, and that there are these underlying architectural impacts, all of these means that uh, it's not necessarily obvious that a compiler optimization that you're doing for speed is not necessarily the compiler optimization you would do for power or energy use. So, uh, so, so what one has to kind of uh, uh, make things. Now, it certainly is processor dependent. People have also shown that for many processors, it's actually a perfectly reasonable assumption uh, to just say, you know, something which takes fewer instructions, fewer instruction in a run time sense, okay, number of instructions executed before you finish is a better from an energy perspective. So these processors tend to have a very flat uh, profile. On the other hand, there are processors where instructions vary quite a bit and their ordering and all will come into play. <coughs> so when it comes to 
uh, what, what, what we have therefore it's kind of a uh, what you would term as a multi objective optimization problem. I have conflicting goals. I have speed, I have uh, whatever time to completion, I have power, I have energy, all of these things we're worrying about. And uh, uh, somehow there's always been this desire to kind of reduce things down to a single number which we then optimize. So you would see a lot of metrics which papers use. So single objective metric like performance per watt, energy per instruction, power delay product, energy delay product, all of these things are out there and you would see the optimization. So if you think about like power delay products, so power is energy over time, right? Rate of energy consumption and delay is time. So power delay products is basically energy, okay? Uh, uh, energy delay product is now getting interesting. It's taking energy and it's taking the delay. So it's optimizing for both. It's somehow it's doing a geometric mean. Uh, energy per instruction <laughs> is energy per unit work. Um, uh, and then you can multiply it by number of instructions taken by your algorithm and what you have. Performance per watt. So it's going to be megahertz per watt. Uh, megahertz is one over time, and watt is joules over time. So time, time cancel out. It's one over joules. So it's energy inverse. Uh, so, so you can kind of analyze these things, but you'll see these kind of metrics. Uh, uh, thing is, at no time would a single metric ever capture entirely what you are necessarily after. Uh, uh, so, for example, it could be maximum performance per watt could be achieved by a setting which gives an unacceptable level of performance. So, uh, usually it may be better to think uh, in terms of more complicated metrics. So, for example, minimal, minimum energy consumption subject to some tolerable impact of performance or maximum performance subject to some given energy consumption limit. So you can have an optimization goal and you can have constraints. So you can say, I want my phone to last for eight hours and now I want to consume as little energy as possible given the typical workload so that I can get away with the smallest battery uh, with, within the phone. So, so I, think, I think a better model does tend to be these kind of things where you have a goal and a constraint, an optimization goal and a constraint and which model you pick kind of depends. But uh, you would see sort of no consistency there because it's obviously very application uh, dependent. Um, a point which I already made that today's uh, computers, even though this slide is several years old, but this remains true, so it's probably remain true forever. Uh, they are uh, extremely poor, an individual component or individual <coughs> subsystem tends to be fairly poor uh, at lower uh, utilization levels, in particular power supply, fans, cooling system, they essentially kind of add up to a baseline which makes things inefficient. So we are here, but we want something like that. We want something where uh, power scales with utilization or another way of thinking energy uh, efficiency remains flat. We want a system which is uh, equally efficient throughout its range. So. Uh, so that essentially is the achieving that energy proportionality is why we need to worry about management because from hardware components alone we can't we can't uh, achieve that. So where are the energy inefficiencies in the system? So one problem is that systems are left uh, on even in even when there is no demand on. So in case of computer, for example, uh, it's left on even in the user's absence. So uh, again, somewhat older slide, but a lot of this data kind of skew that, that lot of office PCs remain powered up after work hours. Like for example, I leave the roughly 400 watt iMac on my office machine, uh, in my office on all the time, because you know, once in a blue moon, I actually remote log into it. Okay, but it's still it's running all the time. Uh, um, so sleep modes are used rather rarely because of this and that we want any time access. Uh, there's some additional substantial uh, additional uh, data out there. So like uh, the group out of UC San Diego kind of quantified it and they were basically saying that look at the partner system, you know, 
$200 a day. Uh, so uh, there are many reasons that this happens. So personal computers often act as servers, either as remote servers or to log in or do certain thing, or in many cases, now we often use them as uh, to receive communication calls and stuff like that. So, uh, so uh, that's, that's been a challenge. Um, second reason is that even when they are being used, this, there's a big mismatch bit, between the speed of the computer and the speed of, at which it is being used uh, between the human user or a mechanical system which is using it. So when you analyze it deep down, your processor and large part of the system are most, most of the time are just second items. So okay, we're waiting for the next thing. Uh, next event to happen, next key to be pressed, and then we do it, and again there's a burst of activity, and again nothing. Our phones and all tend to be a lot like that, and so uh, things, I mean like right now my laptop is, if what I to be not recording, is really not doing anything, right? I'm recording, so I guess it's just doing some stuff. Um, what you can think of systems is that conceptually, they are in two states. They are actively being used, or they're kind of sitting in the state where there's nothing to do, but they're waiting for something to happen. <coughs> uh, so this is the proposed block or off state, and this is on state, uh, or the active state. And what these traces are, this is traces I had collected long, long ago when uh, I was a graduate student like you guys. Uh, uh, so uh, I just still keep using them because these were the early days of windowing systems, so X11 windows, which are used in so what I had done was I had just instrumented the X11 server deep down to just see what fraction of the time it was basically sitting in its idle loop, okay? And there were several traces. The main point I was trying to make out here is that most of the time the thing was doing nothing, okay? 97%, 98%, 96%, okay? And that's true for interactive computing. Most of the time it does nothing. Uh, and uh, now the problem is that most of the idle period are minuscule. I cannot conceivably shut the system down and bring it back up during that time. Uh, but if I could, this basically says that in theory, I have huge gains to be had. So this ability to sh shut down and re revive a system to make better use of ever tinier amounts of idle time is a potential gain to be had, okay? And what that in turn means is that I really need to design these systems so that I can very rapidly turn them off while saving the state and then re very rapidly bring them up while still, uh, while restoring the state. And uh, when I used to do this work in my research, so this was back in 90s, uh, at that time processors were awful in that. Uh, just to shut things down and all would often take milliseconds and this is ignoring any software issues and all because um, uh, sort of the clock oscillators and everything, everything was just kind of pretty, uh, pretty slow. And a uh, lot of these Intel processors and all, when you would uh, change their frequency or stuff like that, they would just stall for long periods of time. Thousands and thousands of instructions, so not very effective. Things have improved tremendously because again, this has been an area of significant optimization. Last time around, I was mentioning that OS still have improved their reboot time quite significantly too variety of strategies, but the same story has true at hardware level also. So that's problem number two, that um, systems tend to be not used continually. And finally, and this is a point which we already saw uh, to some extent, which is uh, we tend to configure our system for peak performance. Uh, that is, uh, so systems are really over provisioned and underutilized. We buy a uh, 300 horsepower car, uh, while well, most of the time we are uh, just cruising, we buy a four gigahertz computer with the fanciest GPU and uh, we are using, not using it all the time. So what's happening is most of the time we are paying that higher baseline cost now uh, in terms of energy. So, um, uh, so this is our, uh, for, so, so, so we designed for uh, that rare occasion we operated at peak level, but most of the time not, and therefore we end up paying that penalty all the time. So this, this is a story that we already saw. So now when we look at 
a typical computing device. Um, <laughs> there are a whole bunch of things in it where, uh, which are energy consumers, all these different pieces of hardware that constitute a computing device. So, uh, of course, there is a processing part of it. So, it could be processors and other, um, other uh, main processors and all bunch of other processors. If you look at a typical mobile SOC nowadays, um, Snapdragon chip or Apple's uh, uh, processors, uh, they have the so-called main cores, which is what we program, but they probably have another half a dozen to a dozen, if not more, tinier processors, which they program for a variety of purposes. Okay, sensor hub and uh, sort of various kind of managers. It's very common nowadays that uh, for different functions on these chips, it's easier to basically put in a, a tiny ARM processor core and write some software for it as opposed to designing a circuit circuit for that because it's just far, far easier. So you will see that these things are kind of your main processor and a whole bunch of these ancillary processors and then some, some custom circuits. Uh, and then ASICs and memory and stuff like that. Then you have the communication related stuff, network interfaces and other variety of IO interfaces. Sensors and actuators of various types, okay? <coughs> I'm using the term actuator in a very liberal manner. Uh, so actuators certainly include motors, but that's not the only type of actuator out there. Um, what kind, uh, I mean, if you think about the devices you probably have on your phone and your watch and stuff like that, there are a variety of actuators in it, right? I mean, um, they have LEDs, they have uh, probably a vibration haptic interface, so that's an actuator. Uh, my watch has the uh, it, uh, the pulse sensor, so it has these uh, green LEDs and all which kind of measure stuff, so that's another actuator, it has the ability to make sound, so there are a whole bunch of these actuators which kind of exist in our devices also, and sensors as well. Uh, you have display and storage, uh, I've written the word disk, but obviously oftentimes uh, increasingly you don't have hard drives, but you have flash drives, and then finally the power supply. As we saw from the data center slide, a big part of energy often goes into the power supply. In fact, if you recall in data center, that number was like 20, 25 percent. Uh, and the reason is these things have inefficiencies and therefore a lot of heat dissipation in all takes place there. Um, a big part of the power supply for ordinary devices is a so-called DC to DC converter. It takes the dirty power supply whose voltage is varying and stuff like that and makes it a stable one, so-called voltage regulator. And these things can be quite inefficient uh, in terms of um, output power versus input power. Moreover, their efficiency depends upon what load you are operating at. They might be very efficient at one power level, but if you increase the power consumption, their efficiency may go down. So this itself had been a, can, can be a source of power consumption indirectly. So let's look at the processor because even though processor accounts for a relatively small fraction in data centers, if you recall one of the slides I had, by the time we had drilled down to the processor, it was like 8 to 10 percent of the overall storage. So it's tiny but still important. On our smartphones and all, it's probably 20 to 30 percent of the storage. Um, so uh, important enough to pay some attention, but don't pay too much attention. Uh, that, uh, don't, don't take the so what you have out here is uh, Intel Core processor, fourth generation. Right now, the processors you probably have in your laptops and all, uh, if it's of the recent year or two, is a sixth generation processor, and Intel just announced its Skylake or whatever seventh generation processor. Okay, so this is essentially two, two and a half years old, three years old. Uh, so, so you see a uh, whole bunch of cores. Big GPU, a lot of cache, and a bunch of other controllers and circuits and stuff like that. So a lot of uh, memory and digital circuits. Now, to give you a little bit of a sense of, uh, from a hardware perspective, and this is going to be pretty much our only foray into this, uh, is that if you look deep down, uh, we have circuits. Those circuits have transistors, and these circuits essentially operate in the uh, by uh, Having two types of transistors, which those of you have never done any BMSI, there are uh, P uh, MOS transistors and N MOS transistors, and which are on and off in complementary voltage settings. 
Uh, and then the output drives some capacitance. That capacitance may be the gate capacitance, the input capacitance of a succeeding stage. So uh, what I've shown out here is an inverter, but essentially you can think of any circuit in these terms that there is some <coughs> TMOS set of things connecting to VDD, uh, to the power supply, there's an NMOS type stuff, uh, graph which is connected to the ground, and at any given point in time, one or the other is on, and uh, so either the output is being pulled up to high voltage or output is being pulled down to the low voltage, and as you make these transitions, the load capacitances are charged or discharged. So there is a movement of charge via the current from power supply to the capacitance or from capacitance back to the ground. These transistors have resistance, so as the current moves through them, we burn heat. So uh, this movement, this charge, discharge of uh, capacitance then results in movement of charges, which in turn results in dissipation of heat out here. So that's uh, in, a, in an operating circuit, that's basically what's happening. We are moving charges around, but we are moving the charges through these resistive transistors, and therefore there is heat dissipation which is going on out there. Very, very, very uh, simple word in the story. So uh, that's the charging phase uh, where the capacitor charge is building up, and uh, then as we switch from turn this guy being on, the PMOS being on, to the NMOS being on, or vice versa, there's some tiny amount of time where one is turning off, another is turning on, so there's some direct flow of the current as well. Uh, so that's the so-called short circuit current. And then finally, uh, uh, we get into the other uh, mode as well. So what, what that means is that we really have three types of current consumption which is happening. Uh, three types, three reasons why power is, uh, is consumed. One is this charge discharge of capacitance. And as you can imagine, this is going to happen proportional to my clock rate or proportional to the rate at which I'm doing work. Every time I change the state of this signal, uh, I'm going to move charge around and therefore this component of energy is going to be proportional to say something about my algorithm. How often are the bit values changing? The second component is also dynamic because every time I change the state, uh, there is again some flow of current and that translates into some power consumption. And the third one, which I didn't say much yet, this is the leakage which happens in the diode down here. So these transistors are made up of diodes and even though we put the voltage in one direction, again, those of you recall your physics, uh, diodes conduct in one direction and not in the other direction, but the reality is that even when they are supposed to be off, they leak a little bit. And that leakage current is the, uh, is, is, is the culprit. It's a continual baseline power consumption is happening. And this is not dynamic. This is static because it's happening all the time. This is the penalty you pay for just keeping the system on. Moreover, the more complicated the system, more likely you will have more transistors in it. And therefore, more likely that you will have a higher leakage. So but this is this is the reason why an over provisioned system is bad because over provisioned system will have more transistors, more gates, and therefore it will have a more baseline power consumption. Uh, the only way to eliminate this is to shut the thing off, cut the power supply. But if we cut the power supply, we lose the state. So then reviving the system back takes more time. So that so you cannot you cannot do that on a very rapid basis. So so, but these are basically your three sources, two types of dynamic power. One is the active switching of uh, charging, discharging of capacitance. The other is the penalty we pay when one side is turning off and the other side is turning off. And final one is this baseline static that we are saying. And there are various circuit level knobs and tricks and different voltages and all that, it, that you can play with to uh, control this stuff, but fundamentally, these are the three things. Then. Switching, short circuit, and leakage, uh, which underlie at least all of CMOS technology, which is a dominant thing that our computers are made of. Okay, there is other static current also. I'm kind of ignoring it, but like our computers are not entirely digital, they have some analog circuits, and IO, IOs and stuff like that, they also, but you can lump them into, they're kind of like leakage, they're a static component uh, that 
exist. So if you pull all of this together, our first order energy model of a digital system looks like the following. That I have some component which is switching related and it turns out, so I already said it will be proportional to my clock because the more I switch, uh, the higher my clock frequency, more often I'm going to be switching. But not on every clock tick will my capacitor switch. That depends on my algorithm. So there's probably some fudge factor alpha. It's a probability that I'm switching. C is the capacitance. More the capacitance on the chip, the more I have to switch. And then voltage squared, it turns out that the energy is uh, component is proportional to the square of the voltage. So this is one component. A second component is the one which happens because of a short circuit. That again is proportional to frequency. It turns out it's proportional also to the same alpha. It will have some short circuit current. This says something about the resistance to the transistor, and then the voltage. And you can think of these things as my entire chip could be viewed as a gigantic capacitance. Okay. Uh, then I have a leakage. <coughs> that again is a characteristic of my whole circuit. And then finally, there is this other residual special system. So at a very high level, I can take a very complicated digital system and then basically say that its power model looks like this, or its energy would be P times delta T, where delta T is the amount of time my algorithm takes to complete. And now if you think about delta T times S is the number of instructions in my program. <coughs> so the frequency of the processor times the time my program takes is the number of instructions. And so that, that is the end. So you kind of multiply these things out and you have a first order model. Uh, so what I'm glossing over out here is the following. You might say, hey, this is really happening at every gate and all. Why don't I have the sigma term and stuff like that? It turns out that a crude model of the chip where you lump everything on the chip or everything in your digital system into a single capacitance, an effective capacitance, works beautifully. I mean, a lot of work has shown that you are basically within single digit percentage levels there. What's happening is that these complicated things with hundreds of thousands and millions of transistors, by the time you take the statistical averaging effect that happens all across them, this good first order model works pretty fine. So now we are down to a model which has whatever, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine parameters. And that's a good first order model of an arbitrary digital system. And so now you can take your program, so the process, let's say you're doing it for a processor, you take your program, you run them, and you do some model fitting to come up with these parameters. And turns out, so MIT for a long while used to have this tool called Joule Track, it's a website where you could go and they would support several processors, and you would upload a program of yours, and then they would run it in some simulator and then spit out the uh, power number out there. So this works pretty, pretty, pretty nicely. It's a good first order model. So we are going to continue this thing. So Monday is a holiday, so we will meet on Wednesday. Uh, but the same, our goal at some level is to understand the same story for other elements of our system and have similar type of models.